Dale Carnegie wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People back in the late 1930s, before we had Gallup polls, case studies, or any hard data about emotional intelligence or positive psychology and how much of an impact it can have on almost every area of our lives. The book was born as a result of a need he saw for a book that did not exist, a book of best practices about human relations. Interestingly, Carnegie has said that he initially intended for the ideas in How to Win Friends and Influence People to be taught not as a book, but as a lecture. But over time, the lecture got longer and longer, and the principles in it were tried and tested on his students over and over until they eventually went from a list of principles on a card to among one of the most influential books in the world having been translated into every language and transforming millions upon millions of lives. In the book, Carnegie provides a time-tested, battle-hardened list of principles and tactics that teach us how to inspire, instruct, and communicate with people in an attractive and elegant way. Many people get the book purely in hopes of seeing the title's promise come true. They wanted to win friends and influence people, And it certainly delivers on the title, but you know what else it does? It also helps others. It helps us help others. And in this way, Carnegie's classic is not only a self-help book, but also a help others book. Here's an overview of what you can expect to learn about in this book summary. We'll talk about empathy, how we don't necessarily need to manipulate people to win them over as friends. All we need to do is genuinely try to understand things from their perspective. Contribution. How we don't need any other reason to help someone or compliment someone for something other than sincerely and genuinely wanting to show our appreciation. We'll talk about confidence. How the more we learn to deal with and communicate effectively with others, the more confident we become in our own ability to achieve our most ambitious goals. We'll also talk about how it's not about winning friends, quote-unquote, or manipulating people like the title suggests, but rather it's about loving people and inspiring them to feel good about themselves and helping you get what you want at the same time. We'll talk about how to get the edge in life and business by learning the tactics and techniques that show you how to put your most powerful asset to use, your personality. You'll also learn soft skills in areas like leadership, communication, and igniting energy and enthusiasm in others. It's important to note that this is not a book filled with philosophical platitudes or lofty theories about life. It's a book based on taking action. He tells you stories about how effective his methods have been for his students, or he talks about the people that he interviewed for this book who range from inventors like Edison, historical American figures like Franklin D. Roosevelt, business people like John D. Rockefeller, and even famous actors and actresses of those times, like Clark Gable and Mary Pickford. He tells you how these folks, as well as so many others, have put his principles into practice, and then he teaches you how you can put them to the test in your own life. Big idea number one. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Quote, Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. End quote. Getting angry and yelling at someone is a great way to gain lots of resentment. But trying to empathize, understand, and see it from their perspective is a great way to gain loyalty, trust, and yes, compliance too. Criticism puts people on the defensive. It makes them want to defend and justify themselves even when they realize they're wrong. Not to mention, it hurts people's feelings. So, An actionable insight for you from this first big idea would be this. Instead of criticizing people, let's try to align with their values, understand where they're coming from, and look to find common ground whenever possible. 
big idea number two. Make other people feel important. Quote, the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. End quote. Freud said the deepest urge in human nature apart from sex is the desire to be important. President Lincoln called it the craving to be appreciated. All of us want to feel it. Your coworkers, customers, cousins, and everyone else you know is wired with a desire to be appreciated. In fact, it's more than just a desire, it's a human need. Every one of us needs to feel like what we do at work, at home, wherever actually matters and makes a difference. So why not do what we can to help people feel important more often? Carnegie tells a story about how Charles Schwab, the first person to earn a million dollars a year by running Andrew Carnegie's United States Steel Company, became wealthy, noting that his secret to success was being hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise to his employees. Here's an actionable insight to help you put this big idea into action. Show people that they matter to you as often as you can by seeing their true value, whether that means by noticing their talents and complimenting them on them, by taking note of their skills, by talking about something that's of specific interest to them and complimenting them on their deep sense of knowledge about that subject. Just show people that they matter to you. The more you do it, the better. Big idea number three, become genuinely interested in other people. Quote, you can make more friends in two months by showing genuine interest in other people than you can in two years trying to get other people interested in you. End quote. Quote, first arouse in the person the eager sense of want. He who can do that has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. End quote. Andrew Carnegie, the quote-unquote steel king, actually didn't know much at all about steel. But he did know how to handle people. When he was a kid, he got a hold of a mother rabbit. And before he knew it, he had a nest full of little baby bunnies. But had nothing to feed them. So, he told all the kids on the block that if they'd collect enough food to help him feed the bunnies... He would name the bunnies in their honor. He had enough food to feed his bunnies in no time. And years later, he used this exact same technique to make himself hundreds of millions of dollars by naming factories and steel mills after prospective business associates and or partners. Franklin D. Roosevelt is remembered by subordinates, maids, mechanics, and more. Not because he was the president, but because he remembered their names, acknowledged them sincerely, and made them feel important, no matter what they did or where they came from. People make excuses about not being able to remember people's names. These folks simply haven't taken the time and effort to do it. If Franklin D. Roosevelt had enough time to do it, so can you. Actionable insight. One of the greatest ways to show people how you appreciate them is to remember their names. This habit can have a profound impact on your life, both in your personal relationships as well as your professional ones. Remembering names matters and makes a difference because pretty much every one of us loves the sound of our own name. So, Let's do our best to remember, pronounce, spell names properly for other people. Big idea number four. Practice the art of listening. Quote, people who talk only of themselves think only of themselves. Those people who think only of themselves are hopelessly uneducated. They are not educated no matter how instructed they may be. One of the greatest listeners of modern times was Sigmund Freud. A man who met Freud described his manner of listening. It's 
struck me so forcibly that I shall never forget him. He had qualities which I had never seen in any other man. Never had I seen such concentrated attention. There was none of that piercing, soul-penetrating gaze business. His eyes were mild and genial. His voice was low and kind. His gestures were few, but the attention he gave me, his appreciation of what I said, even when I said it badly, was extraordinary. You've no idea what it meant to be listened to like that. End quote. Another quote on this same topic of the practice of the art of listening. Listening is just as important in one's home life as in the world of business. Millie Esposito of Croton-on-Hudson, New York, made it her business to listen carefully when one of her children wanted to speak with her. One evening, she was sitting in the kitchen with her son Robert, and after a brief discussion of something that was on his mind, Robert said, Mom, I know that you love me very much. Mrs. Esposito was touched and said, Of course I love you very much. Did you doubt it? Robert responded, No, but I really know you love me because whenever I want to talk to you about something, you stop whatever you are doing and listen to me. End quote. That's a powerful insight, isn't it? Have you ever had a conversation with someone and felt like they were just waiting for you to finish so that they could start talking? That's one of the most annoying types of people in the world. These people don't listen, they interrupt people, and care more about being right than they do about doing what's right. So, an actionable insight to help you become a better listener is in four simple steps. Four steps to becoming a better listener. Number one, listen with your eyes. Number two, wait for people to finish. Number three, digest what they've said by just waiting for a second or two before you respond, and then respond accordingly. Big idea number five, avoid arguments. Quote, there is only one way under high heaven to get the best of an argument, and that is to avoid it. Because a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. End quote. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. So let's say you're giving a presentation in front of a room full of important people. Things seem to be going pretty well until all of a sudden, boom, somebody drops a bomb on your confidence and interjects in the middle of your talk. They're in vicious opposition to the points you're trying to drive home. What do you do? Do you tell them that they're wrong? Do you argue? Do you ignore them? Do you embarrass them for being rude and interjecting in the middle of your presentation? No. Here's what you do. Align and reframe. If someone says, you're wrong, blah, 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 we naturally want to defend ourselves and prove them wrong. But what happens when we do that? Usually, both people end up angry. So, one way to handle this would be to say something like, you know, I can see that, or I can appreciate that, or I understand where you're coming from. Another way to avoid this argument would be to simply agree. Let's say someone says that XYZ company makes better widgets than your company does. Instead of saying, no, they don't, blah, 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 a more effective way to handle it might be to align with them and say something like, you know what, they really are an excellent company, aren't they? I agree with you. XYZ company really does make an excellent quality widget. Now, once you've said that, how could they argue or continue to disagree with you? You've already positioned yourself in a place of agreement with them. You agree with them. You've established a bit of common ground. And once you have aligned, it's time to reframe. And this simply means to gently guide them back to your points without putting your butt in their face. For example, if someone says XYZ company's widgets are the best, we do not want to say, I can appreciate that, but our company's widgets, blah, 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 blah. 
So when we use the word but, when we're responding to someone, it can often come off to them like we're disregarding whatever it is that they just said. So rather than putting your but in someone's face, just use the word and instead. So a great response to XYZ Company's widgets are the best might be XYZ Company makes a great widget. Insert compliment for competitor here. And tell me, how long have you been using their widgets? Or you might say, XYZ Company makes a great widget. And you know what? Tell me something. Have you ever tried ours? Actionable insight. Let's use our emotional intelligence to avoid pushing or arguing or telling people that they're wrong. Instead, let's try to align with them, find common ground with them, and reframe the situation so that both parties walk away from the conversation feeling good about it. Big idea number six, show some respect. Quote, We sometimes find ourselves changing our minds without any assistance or heavy emotion. But if we are told we are wrong, we resent the imputation and harden our hearts. We are incredibly heedless in the formation of our beliefs, but find ourselves filled with an illicit passion for them when anyone proposes to rob us of their companionship. It is obviously not the ideas themselves that are dear to us, but our self-esteem, which is threatened. The little word, my, is the most important one in human affairs. And properly to reckon with it is the beginning of wisdom. It has the same force whether it is my dinner, my dog, and my house, or my father, my country, and my God. We not only resent the imputation that our watch is wrong or our car is shabby, but that our conception of the canals of Mars, of the pronunciation of Epictetus, of the medicinal value of Salican, is subject to revision. We like to continue to believe that what we have been accustomed to accept is true, and the resentment aroused when doubt is cast upon any of our assumptions leads us to seek every manner of excuse for clinging to it. The result is that most of our so-called reasoning consists in finding arguments for going on believing as we already do. End quote. This quote is a great example of how much more we are moved by emotion as opposed to just logic alone. So the key takeaway here is this. No one likes being wrong or being told they're wrong or proven wrong. So let's not do that to people. Let's instead follow the following actionable insight. Show respect for other people's opinions, regardless of whether you agree with them or not. And never say, you're wrong. No one likes to be told that they are wrong. So, let's not do that to people. Deal? Good. Let's move on with big idea number seven. Speak well of others and look for common ground whenever possible. Quote, Martin Luther King was asked how, as a pacifist, he could be an admirer of Air Force General Daniel Chappie James then the nation's highest-ranking black officer. Dr. King replied, I judge people by their own principles, not by my own. End quote. In a similar way, General Robert E. Lee once spoke to the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, in the most glowing terms about a certain officer under his command. Another officer, in attendance when he heard him, was astonished. General, he said, Do you not know that the man of whom you speak so highly is one of your bitterest enemies who misses no opportunity to malign you? Yes, replied General Lee, but the president asked my opinion of him. He did not ask for his opinion of me. Boom! What a class act! When we respect others and show diplomacy, 
Regardless of whether they themselves choose to do so or not, we are showing them and others that we are far beyond such behavior. As Carnegie tells us, quote, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, agree with thine adversary quickly. 2,200 years before that, King Achthoi of Egypt gave his son some shrewd advice, advice that is sorely needed to this day. Be diplomatic, counseled the king. It will help you gain your point. Big idea number eight. If you're wrong, admit it emphatically. Albert Hubbard was one of the most original authors who ever stirred up a nation, and his stinging sentences often aroused fierce resentment. But Hubbard, with his rare skill for handling people frequently, turned his enemies into friends. For example, when some irritated reader wrote in to say that he did not agree with such and such article and ended by calling Hubbard this and that, Albert Hubbard would answer like this. You know, come to think it over, I don't entirely agree with it myself. Not everything I wrote yesterday appeals to me today. I am glad to learn what you think on the subject. The next time you're in the neighborhood, you must visit us and we'll get this subject threshed out for all time. So, here is a hand clasp over the miles and I am yours, sincerely, Albert Hubbard. Wow. Can you say class act? Whenever you feel the need to tell someone something they may not necessarily agree with, make an effort to add, you know what, I could be wrong about this, but if my memory serves me right, add this in either before or after making a statement or point, and your ability to find common ground and influence others will absolutely skyrocket. Another example, sometimes people pretend to know the directions to everywhere they're going. And if someone tells them they're wrong or going in the wrong direction, they get angry about it and say something like, I know, I know, when in fact, they don't know. And everyone else knows that they don't know. And the only thing that results is a little bit less respect for the person playing pretend. What if, instead, the person didn't pretend? What if when they realized that they were indeed heading the wrong way, thanks to someone else's kind advice, They just said, oh my gosh, I I was absolutely wrong there. Thank you so much. No harm, no foul, just a simple mistake any one of us could have made. Actionable insight. When we know we're right, let's try to be gentle with how we persuade. And when we're wrong, which is often, if we're honest, let's just admit it and move on. We'll gain a lot more respect that way. And isn't that the whole reason people pretend to be right in the first place? And hey, if all else fails, just keep this quote from Carnegie in mind. By fighting, you never get enough. But by yielding, you get more than you expected. Big idea number nine. Begin in a friendly way. One of Carnegie's students from his course about how to win friends and influence people mentioned a story about using the techniques taught by Carnegie on his stubborn landlord when trying to get the rent reduced. Here's what he said. He and his secretary came to see me as soon as he got my letter. I met him at the door with a friendly greeting. I fairly bubbled with goodwill and enthusiasm. I didn't begin talking about how high the rent was. I began talking about how much I liked his apartment house. Believe me, I was hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. I complimented him on the way he ran the building and told him I should like so much to stay for another year, but I couldn't afford it. He had, evidently, never had such a reception from a tenant. He hardly knew what to make of it. Then, he started to tell me his troubles complaining tenants. One had written him 14 letters, some of them positively insulting. Another threatened to break his lease unless the landlord kept the man on the floor above from snoring. What a relief it is, he said, to have a satisfied tenant like you. And then, without my even asking him to do it, he offered to reduce my rent a little. 
I wanted more, so I named the figure I could afford to pay, and he accepted without a word. As he was leaving, he turned to me and asked, What decorating can I do for you? Imagine for just a quick second what the outcome would have been if he took the same old fist-in-the-air angry approach that most of the other tenants did when trying to get their rent reduced. Probably not in his favor. Instead, it was the friendly approach that won. Let's try to be like that a little more often when we are trying to get things done and make more happen in our daily lives. Big idea number 10. Let others do most of the talking. You know what most salespeople do when they try to sell something? They talk, 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 talk way too much. The customer gets bored because they don't give a damn about half the stuff the salesperson is saying. And on top of that, it sets off a trigger in the back of their mind that gets them thinking. He cares more about getting the sale than he does about meeting my needs. Once we've done that, it's game over. No customer, no moolah. On the other hand, let's pretend to take on the role of a salesperson for a second, the one that we're mentioning here. Let's think about this. If customers usually leave when we do too much of the talking, then wouldn't it make more sense to do the listening before the talking? This way, we can find out what the customer actually needs. And once we find out what they need or want or are looking for, well, that's when we start talking. What do we say when we start talking? We take what we've learned while we were listening and asking great questions to keep the convo rolling and determine if or how we can help them with what we've got to offer. Listening attentively shows that we care. Asking questions helps us understand. And both of these help us Learn about the other person's values, needs, pains, problems, wants, desires, all of the things that we can use to help them find what they are looking for. Pretty cool, right? That's not all either. Listening and asking questions isn't just for salespeople trying to sell hard goods or services. It's for all of us. Besides, we are all salesperson in some way, shape, or form anyway. Think about it. Imagine you and your friends are trying to decide on a place to eat, and you really want to go to P.F. Chang's, but no one else wants to go. You've got some persuading to do if you really want to go, don't you? That's what selling is. Easy, right? Actionable insight. When we're introducing ourselves or our ideas to someone, let's do 20% of the talking and 80% of the listening. And let's also try to ask more questions while we're at it. Big idea number 11. Get them saying yes at the outset. Quote, The skillful speaker gets, at the outset, a number of yes responses. This sets the psychological process of the listeners moving in the affirmative direction. It is like the movement of a billiard ball. Propel in one direction, and it takes some force to deflect it. Far more force to send it back in the opposite direction. The psychological patterns here are quite clear. When a person says no and really means it, he or she is doing far more than saying a word of two letters. The entire organism, glandular, nervous, muscular, gathers itself together into a condition of rejection. There is usually, in minute but sometimes in observable degree, a physical withdrawal or readiness for withdrawal. The whole neuromuscular system, in short, sets itself on guard against acceptance. When, to the contrary, a person says, yes, none of the withdrawal activities take place. The organism is in a forward, moving, accepting, open attitude. Hence, the more yeses we can get at the very outset, induce the more likely we are to succeed in capturing the attention for our ultimate proposal. It is a very simple technique, this yes response. And yet, how much it is neglected. 
It often seems as if people get a sense of their own importance by antagonizing others at the outset. Get a student to say no at the beginning or a customer, child, husband, or wife, and it takes the wisdom and patience of angels to transform that bristling negative into an affirmative. Quote, the actionable insight here is pretty clear. Help move people in an affirmative direction by getting them to respond with several simple yeses right from the beginning of any persuasive presentation, lecture, or selling situation of any kind. For example, a guy comes in to buy a convertible you're selling, you're a car salesperson, you ask a bunch of obvious yes questions like, so, you like convertibles, huh? Doing this will prime them to become more receptive to your big idea, closing question, or call to action. Closing notes. Nearly every paragraph in this book is pure gold and worth being read, practiced, and perpetuated to other people. Alas, however, if we included the whole book in this book summary, it would defeat the purpose of our purpose in bringing you more knowledge in less time. So, here's a quick recap of the big ideas. Number one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Number two, give honest, sincere appreciation. Number three, become genuinely interested in other people. Number four, practice the art of listening. Number five, avoid arguments. Number six, show some respect. Number seven, speak well of others and seek common ground whenever possible. Number eight, if you are wrong, Admit it quickly and emphatically. Number nine, begin in a friendly way. Number 10, let the other person do a great deal of the talking. And number 11, get them saying yes at the outset.